The following book that has been converted to modern English is called The Gospel Grounds and Evidences of the Faith of God's Elect. By John Owen, this book was published in 1675. Showing, number one, the nature of true saving faith and securing the spiritual comfort of believers in this life is of the highest importance. Number two, the way in which true faith evidences itself in the souls and consciences of believers for their support and comfort under all their conflicts with sin and in all their trials and temptations. Number three. Faithful evidence itself by a diligent, constant endeavor to keep itself in all grace and to exercise in all ordinances of divine worship, both private and public. Number four, a particular way by which true faith evidences itself by bringing the soul into a state of repentance. Examine yourselves whether you are in the faith. Prove yourselves. Do you not know yourselves how Jesus Christ is in you unless you are reprobates? Prefatory Note This treatise, entitled Gospel Grounds and Evidences of the Faith of God's Elect, was given to the world in 1695. The remainder of the title is scarcely applicable as a correct designation of the leading divisions of the work and may perhaps have been added by those who had charge of publishing it. In a preface by Isaac Chauncey, the reader is assured that the treatise is a production of Dr. Rowan. It bears internal evidence of the fact and that he wrote it with a view to publication. When he weighs a formal discussion of some topics connected with the subject, on the ground that he had attempted a discussion of them in other writings, it seems a just inference that it had been his intention to publish the treatise though no explanation has transpired why it was withheld from the press for a period of twelve years after his death. The circumstances of some moment has shown that the work, though posthumous, may be held to contain the deliberate and mature judgment of the author on the question which it treats. His object is not to illustrate the common evidences of genuine religion, or the grounds on which we may conclude that a man is sincere in his religious profession, it is an inquiry, rather, into the evidences on which the elect of God, in any process of self-scrutiny, may ascertain the reality of their own faith. Ascribing a faith all the importance which is due it as the instrumental cause of justification, the author suspends the entire question of the genuineness of conversion upon the existence of a fourfold development or operation of that gracious principle in the hearts of all who may be anxious to discover whether they have been really quickened and born of God. After stating the nature of saving faith, and after a brief exhibition of the gospel as a divine method for the salvation of sinners through the merits of Christ, he proceeds to the trial of faith as the main object of the treatise. In the first place, he shows that faith, if genuine, includes or denotes implicit approval of God's way of saving sinners, in opposition to all schemes of merely human invention for our spiritual deliverance. This approval of the divine plan for our redemption, in which he holds that the very essence and life of faith consist, is founded on the conviction, first, that the salvation revealed in the gospel is in harmony with the perfections and majesty of the divine character. Secondly, that it is suited to the views, desires, and aspirations of a soul enlightened by grace, and thirdly, that it as effectually honors a moral law as if it had been completely fulfilled in the personal ob obedience of the saints. Secondly, faith is shown to imply an approval of the will of God in requiring holiness and obedience of us to the full measure of the perfection and spirituality demanded of us in the moral law. To illustrate the obedience required, he appeals to the light of nature and to the knowledge of good and evil which men enjoy through the law, but he proves that without the light of saving faith there can be no adequate conception of the holiness required by the divine will. He does this urging an acute distinction which might rank as a separate contribution to the doctrine of conscience, and according to this, its authority in determining the moral character of an action by no means implies a love of what is good and a hatred of what is evil. 
The function of conscience he views as exclusively judicial, and he shows that the motive which prompts to action must spring from other considerations. Two grounds are assigned on which faith approves of the holiness required of us. The consistency of such a demand with the perfection of the divine nature, and its fitness when full compliance is yielded with it, to advance us to the utmost perfection which our own nature is capable of. Thirdly, evidence of genuine faith is also afforded when the mind endeavors to keep itself in the due exercise of the grace of faith. In the public and private ordinances of divine worship, if faith is not cultivated in the worship of God, all devotion is corrupted into the empty forms of superstition, as in the ritual of popery, or it becomes a mere wildfire of fanaticism, or degenerates into the rationalism which ignores all worship instituted by the authority of revelation. Judicious directions follow as to the best method of preserving faith and vivid exercise while we are engaged in the various acts of devotion. Fourthly, the last evidence specified of true faith is the evangelical repentance which it produces. Weanedness from the world, the lively remembrance of sin, a becoming intensity of godly sorrow on account of it, and other spiritual duties are described as essential elements in the penitential feelings and exercises of those who really believe unto salvation. The treatise indicates an acquaintance with the true philosophy of human nature, thorough knowledge of the world and of man individually, as he takes the hue of his character from surrounding objects and social influences, and that depth of Christian experience in which our author has perhaps been rarely excelled. He shines in the anatomy of human motives, and while he goes deeply into the subjective workings of faith, he is always keenly alive to the objective realities of evangelical truth. The Christian reader will find this treatise an admirable manual for self-examination. The Editor, William Gould To the Reader As faith is the first vital act that every true Christian puts forth, and a life which he lives is by the faith in the Son of God, so it is his next and great concern to know that he believes, and that believing he has eternal life, that his faith is a faith of God's elect, and of the operation of God. Without some distinct believing knowledge of this, he cannot so comfortably assure his heart before God, concerning his calling and election, nor will it be so far as to carry him forward in all the ways of holiness and doing and suffering the will of God with a necessary resolution and cheerfulness. Doing this in a right manner, according to the tenor of the gospel, is no small part of spiritual skill. Two things are highly requisite to this. First, that he be well acquainted with the doctrine of Christ, and know how to distinguish the gospel from the law, and secondly, that he be very conversant with his own heart, so that by comparing his faith and the fruits of it with that same doctrine of Christ, he may come to see that, as he has received Christ, so he walks in him. All his reasonings concerning himself are to be taken from the word of God, so that whatever judgment he passes on himself may be a judgment of faith, an answer of a good conscience towards God. For all the trials of faith must at last be resolved into a judgment of faith, and before that judgment is made, the soul still labors under staggerings and uncertainties. The design of this ensuing treatise is to resolve the great question, whether the faith we profess is true or not. The resolution of it upon an impartial inquiry must be very grateful and advantageous to everyone who has but tasted that the Lord is gracious. There need be no doubt that the late reverend, learned and pious John Owen was the author. This is not only because good assurance is given by those who were entrusted with his writings, but also because a style and spirit running through the others of his practical writings is very manifest here, and accordingly it is recommended with those others to the serious perusal of every diligent inquiry into the truth about his spiritual estate and condition. Isaac Chauncey Evidences of the Faith of God's Elect Overview 
Securing the spiritual comforts of believers in this life is a matter of the highest importance to the glory of God and to their own advantage by the gospel. For God is abundantly willing that all the heirs of promise should receive strong consolation, and he has provided ways and means for communicating it to them. Their partaking of it is their principal interest in this world, and it is so esteemed by them. But their effectual refreshing enjoyment of these comforts is variously opposed by the power of the remainders of sin, in conjunction with other temptations. Hence, notwithstanding their right and title to these comforts by the gospel, they are often in actuality destitute of a gracious sense of them, and consequently destitute of that relief which they are suited to afford in all their duties, trials, and afflictions. Now the root from which all real comforts grow, from which they spring and arise, is true in saving faith, the faith of God's elect. Therefore these comforts ordinarily correspond to and are proportionate to the evidences which any may have of that faith in themselves. At least they cannot be maintained without such evidences. That we may be a little useful to establish or recover that consolation which God is so abundantly willing that all the heirs of promise should enjoy, I will inquire about the following. What are the principal acts and operations of faith by which it evidences its truth and sincerity in the midst of all temptations and storms that may befall believers in this world? And I will insist on those evidences alone which will bear the severest scrutiny by scripture and experience. The principal genuine acting of saving faith in us, inseparable from it, and indeed essential to such acting, consists in choosing embracing and approving of God's way of saving sinners by the mediation of Jesus Christ, relying on it, with a renunciation of all other ways and means pretending to that same end of salvation. This is what we are to explain and prove. Saving faith is our believing the record that God has given us of his Son, First John 5.10. And this is the record that God has given to us, eternal life, and this life is in the Son. Verse 11. This is the testimony which God gives, that great and sacred truth which he himself bears witness to, namely, that he has freely prepared eternal life for those who believe or provided a way of salvation for them. And what God so prepares, he is said to give, because of the certainty of its communication. So grace was promised and given to the elect in Christ Jesus before the world began, Second Timothy one nine, Titus one two. And that grace is so to be communicated to them and and by the mediation of his son Jesus Christ, that it is the only way by which God will give eternal life to anyone. It is therefore holy in Christ, and to be obtained by him, and to be received from him. Upon our acquiescence in this testimony, on our approval of this way of saving sinners, or our refusal of it, our eternal safety or ruin absolutely depends. And it is reasonable that it should be so, for in our receiving of this testimony of God, we set to our seal that God is true. John 3.33 We ascribe to him the glory of his truth, and in this the glory of all the other holy properties of its nature. It is the most eminent duty we are capable of in this world, and by refusing it to the extent that lies in us, we make him a liar, as it says in 1 John 5.10. This is virtually to renounce his being, and the solemnity with which this testimony is entered is very remarkable. Verse 7. There are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. The trinity of divine persons acting distinctly in the unity of the same divine nature give this testimony, and they do so by those distinct operations in which they act in this way, and in this work of saving sinners by Jesus Christ. This is declared at large in the gospel, and added to it is a testimony that it is immediately applicable to the souls of believers, the sovereign testimony of the Holy Trinity, and this is a witness of grace in all sacred ordinances. There are three that bear witness on earth, the spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three agree in one. Verse 8. They are not essentially of one, and the same in nature as are the Father, Word, and Holy Ghost, yet they all absolutely agree in the same testimony. And they do it by that special efficacy which they have on the souls of believers, to assure them of this truth in this record, so solemnly, so gloriously given and proposed, 
life and death are set before us, receiving and embracing his testimony with an approval of the way of salvation testified to, is that work of faith which secures us eternal life. On these terms there is reconciliation and agreement made and established between God and man, and without this, men must perish forever. So our blessed Savior affirms, This is life eternal, that they may know you, the Father, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom you have sent, John 17, 3. To know the Father is the only true God, to know him as he was sent Jesus Christ to be the only way and means of the salvation of sinners, and to know Jesus Christ is sent by him for that end, is that grace and duty which instates us in a right to eternal life, and initiates us in the possession of it. And this includes that choice and approval of God's way of saving sinners of which we speak. But these things must be more distinctly explained. Number one, the great fundamental difference in religion concerns the way and means by which sinners may be saved. From men's different apprehensions of it arise all other differences about religion. And the first thing that engages men really into any concern in religion is an inquiry in their minds about how sinners may be saved or what they themselves will do to be saved. What shall we do? What shall we do to be saved? What is the way of acceptance with God? This inquiry is what gives men their first initiation into religion. Acts 2, verse 37, Acts 16, verse 30, Micah 6, verses 6 to 8. Once this question is raised in the conscience, an answer must be given to it. I will consider, says the prophet, what I shall answer when I am reproved, Habakkuk 2, verse 1. And there is all the reason in the world for men to well consider a good answer to it. Without it, they must perish forever. For if they cannot answer themselves here, then how do they hope to answer God hereafter? Therefore, without a sufficient answer, always in readiness to this inquiry, no man can have any hopes of a blessed eternity. Now the real answer which men give themselves is according to the influence which their minds are under from one or another of the two divine covenants, the covenant of works and that of grace. And these two covenants, taken absolutely, are inconsistent. They give answers, in this case, that are directly contradictory to one another. So the Apostle declares in Romans 10, verses 5 to 9, the one says, the man that does the works of the law shall live by them. This is the only way by which you may be saved. The other wholly waves this reply and puts it all on faith in Christ Jesus. Hence there is a great difference and great variety in the answers which men give themselves upon this inquiry. For their consciences will neither hear nor speak anything but what complies with the covenant to which they belong. These things are reconciled only in the blood of Christ. This the Apostle declared in Romans 8, verse 3. Most convinced sinners seem to adhere to the testimony of the covenant of works, and so they perish forever. Nothing will stand us instead in this manner. Nothing will save us but the answer of a good conscience towards God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, 1 Peter 3, verse 21. Number 2. The way which God has prepared for saving sinners is a fruit and product of infinite wisdom and powerfully efficacious for its end. As such, it is either received or it is rejected. It is not enough that we admit the notions of it as declared in the gospel, unless we are sensible of the divine wisdom and power that are in it, such that it may be safely trusted too. On his proposal arises the eternally distinguishing difference among men. Some look at it, embrace it, as a power and wisdom of God, others really reject it as a foolish and weak thing, not fit to be trusted to. The Apostle gives an account of this at large in 1 Corinthians 1, verses 18 to 24. And this is mysterious in religion. The same divine truth is proposed to various persons, by the same way and means, at the same time, all in the same condition, under the same circumstances, all equally concerned in what is proposed in it. And yet some of them, upon hearing it, receive it, embrace it, approve of it, and trust to it for life and salvation. Others despise it, reject it, do not value it, and do not trust to it. To the one it is a wisdom of God and a power of God. 
to the other it is weakness and foolishness, and it must of necessity be one or the other. It is not capable of a middle state or consideration. It is not a good way unless it is the only way. If there is any other, then it is not a safe way. It is not the best way, for it is eternally inconsistent with any other. It is the wisdom of God, or it is downright folly. And here, after all our disputes, we must resort to eternal sovereign grace, making a distinction among those to whom the gospel is proposed, and to the almighty power of actual grace in curing that unbelief which blinds the minds of men, so that they can see nothing but folly and weakness in God's way of saving sinners. And this unbelief still works in most of those to whom this way of God is proposed in the gospel. They do not receive it as an effect of infinite wisdom and is powerfully efficacious to its proper end. Some are profligate in the service of their lusts, and they do not regard it. To these may be applied that saying of the prophet, Hear you despisers and wonder and perish. Some are under the power of darkness and ignorance, so that they do not apprehend. They do not understand the mystery of it. For the light shines in darkness, and the darkness comprehends it not. Some are blinded by Satan, who is the god of this world, by filling their minds with prejudice, and their hearts with the love of present things, so that the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, cannot shine into them. Some would mix with it their own works, ways, and duties, because they belong to the first covenant. These things are eternally irreconcilable with this way of God, as the Apostle teaches in Romans 10, verses 3 and 4. By this, unbelief eternally ruins the souls of men. They do not, they cannot approve of this way of God for saving sinners that is proposed in the gospel as an effect of infinite wisdom and power, a way which they may safely trust to in opposition to all other ways and means that pretend to be useful to the same end. And this will give us light into the nature and acting of saving faith which we inquire about. Number three, the whole scripture and all divine institutions from the beginning testify in general that this way of God for saving sinners is by commutation, substitution, atonement, satisfaction, and imputation. This is the language of the first promise. And all the sacrifices of the law are founded on it. This is the language of the scripture. There is a way by which sinners may be saved, a way that God has established and appointed. Now sinners being concerned in the law, the rule of all things between God and sinners would seem to be what they can do or suffer with respect to that law. No, says the scripture, it cannot be so. For by the deeds of the law, no man living shall be justified in the sight of God. Psalm 143, verse 2, Romans 3, verse 20, Galatians 2, verse 16. Nor is it by personally answering to the penalty of the law which they have broken, for they cannot do so, but must perish eternally. For if you, Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? Psalm 130, verse 3. There must therefore be, and indeed there is another way, of a different nature and kind from these, for saving sinners, or there is no due revelation made of the mind of God in the Scripture. But the main design of scripture is to declare that there is such a way and what it is, and this is by the substitution of a mediator instead of the sinners who will be saved, a mediator who will both bear the penalty of the law which they incurred and fulfill that righteousness which they could not attain to. This in general is God's way of saving sinners, whether men like it or not. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God sent in his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. Romans 8, verses 3 and 4, Hebrews 10, verses 5 to 10. He made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21. Here unbelief has prevailed with many in this latter age to reject the glory of God in it. But we have vindicated the truth against them sufficiently elsewhere. Number four. There are various things that are previously required to give us a clear view of the glory of God in the sway of saving sinners. 
These are a due consideration of the nature of the fall of our first parents, and of our apostasy from God thereby. I may not stay here to show the nature or aggravations of them, nor can we conceive them rightly, much less express them. I only say that unless we have due apprehensions of the dread and terror of them, of the invasion made on the glory of God, and the confusion brought on the creation by them, we can never discern the reason and glory of rejecting the way of personal righteousness and establishing this way of a mediator for saving sinners. A due sense of our present infinite distance from God and the impossibility of making any approaches to Him and ourselves is from the same consideration. So likewise is that sense of our utter disability to do anything that may satisfy the law or the holiness and righteousness of God, of our universal unconformity in our nature's hearts and their acting to the nature, holiness, and will of God, Unless, I say, we have a sense of these things in our minds and upon our consciences, we cannot rightly believe, we cannot comprehend the glory of this new way of salvation. And because mankind has had a general notion of these things, or of some of them, though no distinct apprehension of them, many among them have apprehended that there is a need for some kind of satisfaction or atonement to be made, so that sinners may be freed from the displeasure of God. But when God's way was proposed to them, it was, and it is, generally rejected because the carnal mind is enmity against God. But when these things are fixed on the soul by sharp and durable convictions, they will enlighten it with due apprehensions of the glory and beauty of God's way of saving sinners. Number five. This is the gospel, this is a work of it, namely a divine declaration of the way of God for saving sinners through the person, mediation, blood, righteousness, and intercession of Christ. This is what it reveals, declares, proposes, and tenders to sinners, that there is a way for their salvation. As this is contained in the first promise, so the truth of every word in the scripture depends on the supposition of it. Without this, there could be no more intercourse between God and us than there is between him and devils. Again, it declares that this way is not by the law or its works, not by the first covenant or its conditions, not by our own doing or suffering, but in a new way, established in and proceeding from infinite wisdom, love, grace, and goodness, namely by the incarnation of the eternal Son of God by his susception of the office of mediator, by doing and suffering in the discharge of that office whatever was needed for the justification and salvation of sinners to his own eternal glory. Moreover, the gospel adds that the only way to obtain an interest in this blessed contrivance of saving sinners by the substitution of Christ as a surety of the covenant, and thus to have the imputation of our sins to him and of his righteousness to us is by faith in him. Here comes that trial of faith which we inquire about, this way of saving sinners being proposed, offered, and tendered to us in the gospel. True and saving faith receives it, approves of it, rests in it, renounces all other hopes and expectations, and reposes its whole confidence in it. For it is not proposed to us merely as a notion of truth, to be assented to or denied, as if only in this sense are all those who believe the gospel called Christians, they do not consider it a fable. Rather, it is proposed to us as that which we ought to engage practically, trusting to it alone for life and salvation. And I will speak briefly to two things. Number one, how does saving faith approve of this way? On what accounts and to what ends? Number two, how saving faith evidences and manifests itself by this to the comfort of believers. This is the first part of the Evidences of the Faith of God's Elect by John Owen. This is a Puritan and Reformed audiobook podcast. www.puritanaudiobooks.com